All right, guys, today I wanted to make a video just uh, covering some of the football that I have watched over the past week or so that I haven't already talked about. So we'll start off uh, with one of the games from last week in the, uh, well, European qualifiers for the next Euros in 2024, and that's Germany. It's Germany. It, yeah, the Euros is in Germany, but this was uh, Georgia versus Norway, uh, resulted in a 1 1 draw. And yeah, it, it was an interesting game. Uh, Norway beginning the game with the stronger side and their front three of Solbak and Sorloth and El Yunusi uh, linked up really well. And Sorloth managed to get the uh, first goal really well taken finish by him. And it, he just looked like a different player to what we saw in the Premier League from him uh, when he had, a, I think he had a couple of spells at Crystal Palace uh, which were pretty forgettable, to be honest. Uh, definitely didn't have the impact he was expected to. And yeah, that, that sort of halted his career a little bit. But in this game, he was quite impressive. And for Georgia, it took them a while to get into this game. Uh, I, I, I think the way they set up was a bit peculiar. And they, they were definitely to, uh, looking to uh, attack George, uh, Norway on the counter rather than uh, using build-up play with the amount of speed they had on the counter attack and it was interesting watching Farrat Skellia, you know, George's talisman in this game uh, because he started off fairly centrally in like a front two almost and he couldn't really get involved but once he started coming deeper throughout the first half and getting on the ball, you know, and managing to pick it up and run with it, that's when he started to be a bit more effective. And yeah, that, that, that's obviously just what his game is really, rather than uh, waiting to receive the ball, ball and um, you know only having a touch before trying to get a shot off. That's not really his game. So yeah, it, it, he got better as the game went on. And I think once he started playing better, that's when Georgia started playing better altogether. And one of these counter-attacks in the second half uh, resulted in a goal from Mikatadza. It was a really well-taken finish, actually. Uh, the header to get it past the defender was perfectly timed. And once he got into shooting position, he took it really well. It was it was just a really well-worked goal. And, yeah, um, I think in the end, a draw was a fair result in this game. Although Norway had an amazing chance to win it through Erdegaard late on. And, you know, it's one of them where... 95% of the time Martin Erdegaard scores that, but on this one occasion, the one time he would have wanted to score it, um, he skies it over the bar, so just one of them really. Um, and yeah, it, it's definitely not something you'd expect from such a technically gifted player like uh, Martin Erdegaard either. But yeah, I think a draw was a fair result. It was a close game between uh, two teams who definitely have different styles in uh, playing football and yeah it's going to be interesting to see how Georgia do in like things like the Nations League so I think even with how much they have improved recently having a, a few players in their team who um, are, are managing to play at, at like a fairly high level in European football Kvara Skelly is obviously the you know main sort of or, or obvious example of this but uh, I, I can't see them qualifying for the next Euros. But it would be interesting to see how they do in the Nations League now that they're in the second uh, tier of it, having been promoted from the third tier. And yeah, for Norway, I mean, Haaland, I, I think, could have added something. But I think the way that Sorloff played, he, he, they didn't miss him too much because I, I think Sorloff played quite well and managed to link play up. Uh, too, which which was uh, really impressive from him, and yeah, um, I I remember reading something a few years ago as well about how uh, Crystal Palace actually had a choice between signing Erling Haaland and Sorloff many years ago, and they went for Sorloff. How different things could have been? Can you imagine that Erling Haaland's not not uh, you know scoring five goals in the Champions League for Man City, but instead just you know rocking up at Selhurst Park every weekend? That'd be well, good for Crystal Palace, but it'd certainly be uh, interesting to see how things uh, could have turned out differently had that have happened. But uh, yeah, the things went they went went the way they went, I guess, in the end. And then over to the Premier League, 
Brighton and Brentford played out a thrilling 3-3 draw on Saturday afternoon, which was, you know, just a brilliant game to watch. Uh, two of my favourite teams to watch in the Premier League right now, Brighton and Brentford. Uh, well, let's face it, my own team, Liverpool, aren't much to watch at the minute. But, uh, yeah, th this game had, well, what you expect from Brighton and Brentford, actually. Brighton, uh, you had, you know, domination in possession, a lot more shots than Brentford, but Brentford were... They they were efficient in front of goal in terms of they, they didn't have many shots, but they still managed to score three. But they were also a lot uh, quicker in their build-up play. Like we saw for the uh, second Brentford goal from Ivan Tony. it literally just comes from an interception from a throw-in. And Mbirmo plays a small, cute ball over the top to Tony, and Tony finishes it. Um, that, that That's just a perfect example of how Mbirmo and Tony like to link up. And... I think also it it's shows a slight deficiency in the way that um, Brighton can sometimes play in terms of how they do leave themselves open at the back on some occasions. And that, that's bound to happen really with the way that Brighton's are set up under Roberto De Zerbi uh, with, you know, uh, so like a... It's, it's hard to say what formation they play because on paper it's like a four at the back, but... It, it often becomes a three at the back with, with uh, one of the full-backs pushing forward, usually a Stepinian, and it, it, it can leave gaps in places somewhere which can be exploited. And the other two Brentford goals came from set pieces being scored by uh, two centre-backs, actually, Pontus Janssen and Ethan Pinnock, and uh, both brilliant deliveries. I think the first one was from Janssen, and it's a cracking header for Janssen. And uh, Mbirmo actually got, got two assists in this game. Brilliant delivery for Pinnock's uh, third goal for Brentford as well. And Brighton, they, they did well to come back each time because if you don't know, uh, all, all you know, the goals were it, it, Brentford, Brighton, Brentford, Brighton, Brentford, Brighton. It, it, you know, Bre Brentford kept taking the leads and Brighton kept equalising. But um, yeah, Brighton, they, they did well to come from behind each time and, and their goals were really impressive as well. The first equaliser from Mitoma is a brilliant finish, but what a pass from Jason Steele, goalkeeper. And I, I think I've been more impressed with him than I have with uh, Robert Sanchez because I, I've got to be honest, with Robert Sanchez, I've never been completely sold by him. Um, I, I just think that he's got a lot of errors to his game and sometimes fails to do the basics as a goalkeeper. I understand that he works well for Brighton in terms of he has good distribution and is good with the ball at his feet. And that, that's why he has been in the Spain squad. But I, I just think there are <clears throat> too, too many errors to his game. And with Jason Steele, although he's not top, top quality, you, you get a bit more consistency, I think. And yeah, that, that pass was a thing of beauty for Matoma. And yeah, the, the other two goals as, as well. Well, well Bex was, was a really nice goal, but the penalty... McAllister, you know, he, he scores it. It's not the highest pressure situation he's been in the past few months, but um, it, it was definitely a penalty. Uh, and Dav, when, when he strikes the ball, Hickey is, yeah, it, it's, it, he's not completely stuck his arm out, but he, I think he knows what he's doing, to be honest. And yeah, it, it's got to be a penalty shot on goal. And th there's been questions over, is it a red card? And I, I can definitely see the the reasons behind it, but what I would say is it's not a certain goal from Ndav. It, it's a shot on goal, but it's not it's not a certain goal. Like we, we've seen uh, players get yellow cards for like blocking the ball when it's on the line recently, and I just think that's wrong because at that point you may as well do it. You may as well be a goalkeeper if you're an outfield player. I think. If it's a certain goal and the referee judges it that way, it's got to be a red card for me personally. Um, but but yeah, it ended in a draw and, you know, what a brilliant game of football to watch from two of the most exciting teams in the Premier League right now in terms of the way that they run, the way that they play football, um, the, the way their managers set them up and, and the way they, re they recruit players as well. They don't, you know, the, the players they sign, when they sign them, they're not players you've ever heard of, but they make them into stars, which I, I really like. It's um, it's a very efficient way of doing things, but also a way that, you know, can, can continue. It, like, 
I, I just think it's really impressive. And then in what was probably the shock result of the weekend, but at the same time, something that's not too unexpected uh, because they're only one position apart in the league table, Aston Villa managed to beat Chelsea at Stamford Bridge, which is a really impressive result for them. But it, it was just one of them where it's, it's another disappointing performance from Chelsea, but you, you, you sort of come to expect it. And this is the final nail in the coffin for Graham Potter as, you know, yesterday he lost his job. And I, I don't think that it, it was the right move for Graham Potter in the first place. I, I said that all along. I, I thought he had a really good thing going at Brighton and I think better opportunities would have come along because right now Ch the Chelsea job is a risky job and I don't think you've got much security in it. You probably have financially, but in terms of a career move, it's, it's not the best option, I don't think, right now. But in this game, uh, Villa, they, they, they were just a lot more clinical in front of goal. They took their chances. Chelsea didn't. Uh, Chelsea's two best chances in this game fell to one player, and that was Mikhailo Madrick. And he failed to take both of them. The one of them, I think the second one where he's played through on goal and he has time to think about it, it just shows a complete lack of confidence he has right now because he has time to, and, and he knows what he wants to do. But it's so easy to read from Emmy Martinez when you just look at what Martinez has to do. He can see what Midrick's going to shape up to do. There's no disguise on it whatsoever. He gives himself away too easily, Midrick, and in the end, the finish as well. Just the, I mean, the power on the shot alone is just completely weak and so easy for Martinez to save. So... Really not good enough uh, finishing from Madrid. But Villa, they, they took their chances really well. Uh, McGinn was really unlucky not to score a brilliant goal in the first half when he hit the crossbar, but soon made up for that in the second half. But that was after Watkins put Villa in the lead with a similar goal to uh, Mitoma, what Matoma scored against Brentford in terms of just waiting for the ball to bounce at the right time and then lobbing uh, the outcoming goalkeeper. And that 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 was that put uh, Villa one 0 up, and the f the finish from McGinn to make it two 0 was sublime. Really, um, I th I think it had been so easy to have just struck that as hard as he possibly could, but uh, he decides to powerfully side foot it and gets it perfect, spot on, whips it right into the corner, giving Kepa very little chance of saving it. But yeah, um, Villa they, they've doing really well under Unai Emery right now and it's still possible that they could get a European spot this season it'll be hard for them to do but the form they've been in since November when Emery came in it, nothing's impossible and Ollie Watkins I mean the turnaround in his form under Unai Emery compared to Steven Gerrard has just been unreal um, he, he looks like a completely different player with a lot more confidence and Someone who, who looks like he can score a goal at any time. So yeah, uh, Unai Emery's doing a superb job at Aston Villa right now. But we have to talk a bit about Chelsea. And it, it was never going to be um, a successful season for them this year with, with what they've had going on in terms of the uh, revolution of their squad. And yeah it's, it's it's not gone well has it but uh I, I don't think there was many people who expected it to and I, I think s some of the tactics in this game as well from uh graham potter just didn't work at all really the, the playing like it, it was it was hard it was hard to tell if it was a three at the back or a four at the back so, like with uh, two left backs and one center back it, it just didn't work at all and i, I think with, with the with the instant expectations Chelsea will have of Graham Potter, you, you can't you can't just constantly experiment with the team. Like he's, you've got to get results, but experiment as you go along. Graham Potter has, has spent the last six months just experimenting, but not getting results. You've got to consistently get results for Chelsea. Whereas with Brighton, he was able to find out what works, what doesn't. And in, in, after a couple of years and bringing in the players into the team that he thought would make them a good team, it, it eventually got going and started working. But he, he was never going to be able to 
have that time at Chelsea, I don't think. So yeah, I think I think that's partly why it, it, it didn't really work for him. And then the final game I wanted to cover today was between West Ham and Southampton. Uh, battle at the bottom. I think they both started uh, yesterday in 19th and 20th position. So <clears throat> in, in, in reality, it was, it was a must-win game for both teams. And uh, in the end, West Ham won 1-0, uh, which was a uh, really good result for them. But I, I don't think it was a great performance, to be honest. I, th I thought Southampton, at, a lot of the time in the game, were the better side. But it, in the crucial moments, they didn't take advantage of the chances they had. And for the West Ham goal, um, it, it was poor marking from Southampton to leave uh, Naya Fagerd completely unchallenged. I, I know they were trying to play a bit of an offside trap, but there's always a risk that one of them is going to manage to stay on side. And Fagerd did only just, but it was enough. And it, at that point, when Aguerd has a free run, it takes a half-decent ball for Aguerd to have a really good opportunity to score, which he did. And in the end, that, that cost Southampton because with the chances they had, Perro and Suleimana came close, but the closest they came was from Onoachu, the substitute. And it, he managed to flick a header onto the bar. Second time that crossbar was hit in the game, actually, Jarrett Bowen striking it in the first. But yeah, th this game is, is going to be one that Southampton, uh, I think, regret a little bit because even though it is really tight at the bottom, with Southampton being the very bottom team holding everybody else up, it, it's going to be tough from then from for, for them from now on. They're, they're going to need, I reckon, out of their last, what, what have they got? They must have 10, 11, 12 games left, and no, no, no more than 12, certainly. Um, I'd say about 11. So out of that 11 games, they're going to need, I reckon, four wins and a couple of draws to have any chance of staying up, really. So it's going to be really tough for them to stay up from here, I think. And I, I'll be honest, I don't give them uh, much opportunity, to be honest. And just looking at the team that Southampton put out yesterday, the midfield of James Ward-Price and Romeo Lavia, that, that's quite a strong midfield. But other areas of the pitch, you, you just think, yeah, that's it's, it's not high enough quality. I I just think with Chiletta, Saar and Bednarek, I, I don't think that's good enough. Uh, I think they when they're playing without Armel Belakotchap and Salisu, I, I just think they, they don't look at the level. Bednarek I'd put considerably higher than Chiletta, Saar. I think... Still yet to see a good game from Shaletta Sar, to be honest. Um, he, he's not a player who's, I think, Premier League standard, to be honest, because he, he's just so rash. I don't think he's good enough with the ball at his feet and makes so many errors as well. So, yeah, he's, he's someone they need to, you know, replace in this team, in, in, in my opinion. But in other areas of the pitch, like I said, midfield... And fullbacks as well. Perro, good attacking fullback. Kyle Walker Peters, good all round fullback. Someone who, you know, is good enough to play, I think, at the highest level, Walker Peters, with the ability as on the ball. I think sometimes he can be a bit questionable defensively, but on the ball, he's brilliant. It's just in attacking areas, they don't have a player who's going to be clinical in front of goal, and that's what's going to cost them at the end of the season if they do go down, I think. But for West Ham, yeah, like I said, brilliant results and um, it's it's been a terrible season for them given how strong their squad actually looks when you list off some of the players they've got. So on, on top of the squad they had a couple of years ago, <clears throat> they've now got the likes of Lucas Pakatar, Gianluca Scamacca, I know he's been injured a lot this season, but Naya Fagerd as well, Emerson Palmieri, they, they've, they've got such a good squad but for some reason they've really struggled this season and it is quite bizarre if anything to be honest um, so yeah it's been a real disappointment they've just got to make sure they can stay in the division and just do better next season and I think had they've lost this game I think David Moyes could have been in real trouble and we, we could have seen three Premier League managers lose their jobs over the weekend I think had uh, West Ham have lost this game because it would have meant they were rock bottom if Southampton won and you know that'd be a huge blow for them this season.